folks. A guy down the street called me the other day. He said, hey, I have this old generator I'm just going to get rid of. Yes, I want it. But it's kind of old. Yes, bring it here. So here it is. We're going to go through it. Hasn't been ran in years, supposedly. I think he said it was his brother's or something. They used it in their motorhome or something or a little camper trailer. So let's go through it. Get this old generator. Looks like it's a Sears Craftsman generator back up and going with a Briggs engine. And five horsepower from 1985. So 1985, 1986 is when this was made for Sears. Um, by, see if we can see a model number on there. So the model number starts with 580. That is the prefix. So if you don't know, everything from Sears was made by other companies. And what they did is they put a prefix and that tells them what company made it. So that was actually made by, I looked it up real fast, a company called Gold Star that made like lab equipment and stuff like that. So they hired them to make a generator. And it does say 2100 watts. I'm thinking that's running and not peak, you know. Sometime in the 90s, everything now, you know, this would probably say 3,000 watts peak. Because five, five horsepower should be able to do 2,100 watts. So, hopefully, that would be good if it is. Okay, the death sentence for these old Briggs is the gas tank. If the gas tank is all rusty in there, like super rusty, there's a second bowl under there, it gets rusted out. It's a death sentence for these, because you can't find these tanks easily anymore off eBay. And it costs more, you know, if this is on a tiller or something like that. It's cheaper just to replace it with one of these new Chinese engines because you'll pay as much for this gas tank as you will a whole complete engine. But the gas tank in here looks beautiful. So we're just going to go through. We're not going to even get an attempt to start it or anything. We're just going to clean the carburetor and mainly just replace a little diaphragm on there, which is a fuel pump. I'll explain it. Right here. And the nice thing is, is generally the muffler comes straight out and you have to remove the muffler or fiddle around some application kind of fiddle around this one they have the muffler going back here so this is probably the easiest diaphragm i've ever come across so we'll just replace this guy diaphragm real fast it's just four little flathead screws and i don't know that is this all gummed up it's so clean in there I, like i don't even know if i need to uh clean out the main jet or anything We'll look, but I don't think I do. I might not even have to remove the carburetor. It might just be as simple as removing the diaphragm. So it's just four little screws. And then this one has a little roll pin back here. It just kind of helps locate it. There's two different styles of these. And so there's two different gasket types. But the thing is, is the new gasket type covers both models, but the old gasket type only covers the, uh, the, older, model, the older models, if that makes sense. Um, so you pretty much only buy the new gasket type. That's pretty much all they sell. And so you have a little plate here. This right here is air fuel pump. And under there, there'll be a spring and a little like pr spring protector thing. All right here. And this should just barely protrude. I have had these smashed down. I think because people smashed them down and have had to replace this before, but generally you don't. Um, it just protrudes just barely. And this is your diaphragm. Actually doesn't feel too bad, but it's just a little bit crunchy. So what happens is the as the engine goes up and down, it pulses this, which creates a little suction, and it sucks fuel up to this top one and spits it down through the bottom one into a separate bowl. So right under this carburetor, there's a little cup. It looks just like this, just a little cup directly under it with little holes around the top so this pumps up excess fuel and it just fills up this little bowl from the very bottom so the bottom sucks up through here fills up this little bowl and then the carburetor uses that fuel to run the engine and it's just like you know, a carburetor with a bowl on the bottom but it's just inside this tank and if that bowl gets rusty which it does if the tank's rusty it'll get holes and stuff down in here and it'll just it'll just flow out all the fuel it can never hold fuel so we'll take out the carburetor just because we're here, we're this far, it's, it's not that painful. Um, the tank is held by a bolt down on the bottom and then it's held on, and then there's three screws that hold it onto the carburetor and the carburetor is held on with two bolts. Trick to removing the carburetor, they put these long, they're bolts, but they have slots that go all the way across. They're not really Phillips, 
but usually I break them free with a screwdriver like that on the side. Leave the top one tightened down, and there's one hidden under here that you guys can't even see, but the body blocks it. And so leave that one tightened down, and then usually you can get your fingers in there. Otherwise, you're sitting there for 20 minutes with a wrench. We'll bring the bottom one out, and you can't even take it all the way out sometimes because of the body of the car, but we got it. So, I don't know if you guys can see that. Now, the top is generally easy to get out. So you kind of want to do a combination. So I have that loosened, but then I also want to loosen the carburetor off the tank. But it is still mounted down here. But then there's going to be a governor linkage. It's kind of a, it's kind of a puzzle. So, Break the carb free. Carb. It's all I used to work on years ago, but nobody, these are gone. These, all these Briggs engines are gone now. You know, I used to be able to get a tiller and that's all that was on them. And those days are dead though. I mean, this is 85. I mean, we're looking at a 40-year-old engine. Okay. I got the uh, throttle linkage disconnected. So now I can pull the whole carburetor off. And it looks beautiful. Nice. This particular one is a generator, and it needs to run at an exact 3600. So there is actually a separate little adjustment knob there. So we got all this. And there's our upper fuel bowl. Right there, and it looks fantastic. Look at that. So this right here pulls fuel from the bottom of the tank, comes up here, and then there's a little hole right here directly below this secondary little bowl up top, and it just dumps fuel down so this one can pick it up and go through the main jet and everything else. Could not be easier carb to clean. This is our main jet. We don't even need to mess with the adjustment because it's fixed into this nut. So we can just take that whole assembly out. You don't even need to, like, so the adjustment's still set. And then we can just start spraying through the different passages. So here's the other half of the jet, but the needle, you know, the distance of this needle plugging up that hole is how much fuel goes through the engine. And you'll notice just a couple different passages back there, but just follow, you know. This is a tube that comes up, so there has to be a passage that goes down to it, and there is just right in the side of the thread. So just spray through it. Just spray through the different passages. You'll see them all. Super basic. Let some carburetor cleaner just sit down in the in the bottom for a minute and just run around, but that carburetor's clean. There's nothing you can do. You don't need to replace anything. I see people buying these jets and stuff like that. They just they don't wear out. There's no reason to spend the money, the the eighty dollars uh, eighteen dollars for the rebuild kit for this because they're not worn out. Everything's just dirty. Just clean it, done. You don't throw away your socks every time they get dirty, you just clean them. And they work just as good as new. Wall bro. There we go. Briggs. There's probably 20 in there. They're dirt cheap. I mean, these things are... I think I paid 20 cents a piece for them. Maybe 50 cents. But that's it. It is easier to do this when the carburetor is on its side like this. Like I said, this just barely protrudes. Um... Let's see if I can show you guys. That's it. I've seen these things where people have these protruding. I mean, it should take very little force to even make it level. I've seen these things where people stretched out the spring. But I like this style because it has this little peg back here. Some of them don't have this little peg. So you can just hold it in place. And these little fingers just touch right here. And down there it doesn't actually cover that hole over here so all we do is get it put it on no sealant no rtv rtv and carburetor should not go carburetors hate rtv they eat it so if you're ever putting silicone or rtv on a carburetor you've messed up this style right now these diaphragms absolutely hate ethanol fuel and you'll get maybe a year before these dry out to the point 
maybe a year and a half before these dry out to the point that they don't work anymore and they're too stiff to pump the fuel. If you use ethanol free, usually you can get about five years, maybe a little bit longer, depending on how much you use it. If you use it, the more you use it, the better it is. There's a wheel. It's a little low, but just barely. Fine enough to run. No, nothing gets the oil changed until they prove themselves. Who knows if the generator head's bad. Check that out. The original spark plug. So Briggs and Stratton would put the boot on and they would paint the spark plug. They'd paint the engine with the spark plug in there. So that right there is the original spark plug, which I'm happy to see actually. I would not change that. I think people change spark plugs in small engines like way more often than they need to. They essentially change them like seasonally, which is equivalent to changing them every like 150 miles in your car. Okay, we have it up to about here. So she should be cold and ready to, ready to fire up. Let's see if she fires right up. And we have a newer, I think this is only about a year old, 12,000 BTU AC unit. We'll stick that girl outside, we'll fire it up, see if we'll run this. Okay, putting out 125 volts. We're actually only uh, 60 hertz. I should probably be a little bit higher than that right now. Plug this in. I might go turn up the RPM just a little bit because it's going to drop off. And we hit power. Fans on. I think this takes a second to actually turn on the AC. There it did it. It faded out for a second, but we're pulling 750 watts. I'm going to turn that RPM up just a little bit. We were 59.3 hertz. Got blowing nice and nice cold. So the hertz right there doesn't matter too much on most electronics, but on a motors, like this has a compressor motor in there, it does. The hertz is actually what regulates an AC's motor speed. You have it too low and it'll move too slow, draw more amps. You have it too fast, it'll spin faster than it should. Um, so that's why I like to really adjust that. The voltage doesn't matter that much. Uh, we're 114 volts. You done? Come hop. 